Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Ignat Beresnev. I'm a server-side Kotlin developer advocate at JetBrains, and I'm just going to jump right into it. So once upon a time, I was looking at package repositories of other languages. You know, the websites that allow you to search for packages in a convenient way, where each package has a nice-looking page with essential information and various stats. And a really good example of that is pubdev, the package repository for Flutter. Since Flutter is multi-platform, you have the platform filters. Um, when you're searching for a library, it looks very useful. It says which platforms a specific package supports. And when you open the packages page, you can see all of this cool information, and not only the readme, but also the change log, the examples, the installation instructions, and much more. As I was looking at all of these websites, I couldn't help but think, how come we don't have anything like that for Kotlin or Java? And some of you may argue that we actually do have something similar. And yeah, don't get me wrong. I, I, I love Maven repository. I use it myself all the time. But when you search for something like gRPC, it just shows you a bunch of random artifacts, and you don't even know which one to, to choose. And when you do choose one and you go to that page, there is some information, the license, tags, home page. But I want the readme. I want the examples. I want the installation instructions, the stats, all of that other cool stuff that the other websites have. But most importantly, I want to know if this is a KMP library. And if it is, which platforms it supports. So I asked myself, how difficult can it be to build something like PubDev but for Kotlin? And ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of how I tried to build it, what I learned in the process, and how you can help. It was obvious that I needed to scan Maven Central. It's the de facto standard repository in our ecosystem, and if I rolled my own, no one would use it. The first discovery was that the whole Maven Central was only 54 terabytes. This is something that you can actually fit in your home lab NAS. But however, as tempting as it may be to just clone it, full scraping is against the terms of service, and you will get yourself banned. Oh, but I can build a distributed system of agents that will use proxies to avoid rate limits and get the whole thing. I trust you that you can, but please don't. Maven Central has it bad enough as it is. There's actually an article about that that came out just a year ago. All those cloud CI/CD agents do enough DDoSing already. Maven Central actually provides REST API. Well, kinda. Um, in reality, it's just a publicly facing instance of Solar, which is a search engine like Elasticsearch. So it's not as convenient to use, but it gets the job done. The biggest question was, how do I differentiate KMP packages from non-KMP? Um, because that's what I want to build the website for, to search for KMP packages. And as it turns out, it's very easy. Whether you know it or not, each KMP dependency publishes a file called Kotlin Tooling Metadata JSON. Uh, it's done automatically, so you don't have to do anything. And using this knowledge, we can write a query to Solar Search, um, the REST API of Maven Central, that finds all KMP dependencies. That is. All, all dependencies that have this file. And if you execute the query, it will find about seven or 8,000 unique dependencies, meaning a unique combination of group ID plus artifact ID, so that's not accounting for the versions. Um, and I'm sure Maven Central will barely notice if we just download all of them. So we just learned how to scan Maven Central for, for KMP dependencies without DDoSing it, which means we can build Calibs.io, the, the website for dependencies in Kotlin. And we need to start with something. So we can start by just displaying all dependencies we found in one huge table um, that just has the group ID, artifact ID, and version. And the idea is, whenever you click on the Details button, it'll open a separate page with more information about that specific dependency. But what should that page contain? And what can it contain, more importantly? Let's try to build it from scratch. And we can use Kotlin X HTML as an example of our library. Um, here are the files that, that get published to Maven Central. Um, we don't really need the sources of the library. We don't really need the jar. We don't need information about their Gradle setup, but we can extract some information from the POM file. If you've never seen a POM file, this is what it looks like. I don't expect you to be able to read any text. We actually will look at it in more detail in just a moment. But this is basically an XML file that describes the dependency um, as various uh, yeah, information and transitive dependencies and whatnot. So the schema, or the model, is actually predefined. So we kind of know what fields to expect in there. And first up, we have the name. You would think 
that name is a pretty important element and it would be mandatory, but it can be actually an empty string. But either way, if it exists, we'll place it here. Then we have the description. It's also a very useful element, but it's also optional. But if it's, if it's there, we'll put it under the name. Then the version, we can display it right here. Above the version, we have the group ID and the artifact ID. Combining all three allows you to add that dependency to your project, as I'm sure you all know. So we'll just create a copy-pasteable code snippet for convenience and put it here. Then we have some URLs. The first URL can, can be anything. It's more like a home page. Uh, the second URL under SCM is usually a link to GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. These look useful, so let's put them here. There's also some non-essential but interesting information about the dependency, like its developers, and we got to give credit where credit is due, so why don't we just display them right here. And of course, the license. Very important. The interesting thing about this element is that the name of the license can be anything, literally anything, um, which means that there are at least 25 different ways to write Apache License version 2.0, at least the ones that I was able to find out. And I personally would honestly expect this to be an enum, at least for the most popular licenses, um, to simplify dependency analysis and yeah, enforce consistency. But alas, I have to work with what we have. Either way, we can display it right here. And going back to the files of Kotlin XHTML, we've extracted everything that we can from the POM file. But there is one more file that we can use, which is Kotlin tooling metadata that was mentioned earlier. Um, it's basically a big JSON, and I cannot put it on the slide in full, no matter how you put it. But if we zoom in, one of the first properties that you'll see is actually the information about the build system. Um, it's useful to know, I guess, that this was built with Gradle 8. Then we have the build plugin information, called in multi-platform plugin of version 2.0, meaning it was built with Kotlin 2.0. Um, this, this might be useful for compatibility reasons or just as a curious piece of information. So just put it here above developers. This JSON also contains information about the Kotlin multi-platform targets of this library. So it lists the platforms, like Kotlin Native, Kotlin JS, Kotlin JVM, Kotlin Wasm. We can display it at the top. And it goes into even more details. Not only does it say that it supports Kotlin Native, but it says which specific targets of Kotlin Native are supported, like iOS, macOS, Windows, or Linux. Using this information, we can build a little component like this and place it here. And then we just scan the rest of the versions of this artifact and display them at the bottom. And there are so, so many more fields in the POM model. Like This page could, could contain so much more useful information. It could, it could have links to CI builds, issue trackers, even mailing lists, because the whole model was designed in 2000s. Right? But since all of these elements, all of the POM, POM model elements are, are optional, they're really not filled by the uh, library authors. Right, so, and I cannot blame them if this information is not displayed anywhere, if it's not used by anyone, then why bother? So this is pretty much as good as it gets. But that's it. That was easy. That's perhaps the first takeaway from this talk. You can just like build things. Even if it sounds difficult at the start, it might not be. And I mean, look at what we just built. To me, it looks awesome. It already is more useful to me, at least, than Maven repository. Um, and you know, you parse some JSONs, you produce some other JSONs, you have yourself a website. So all cool. Or so I thought, but don't relax just yet. As I was testing this new page, I scrolled to Kotlin X realization, and I realized that it has seven artifacts, and each of them will have a separate page. But I see Kotlin X realization as a single library. So I want a single page for Kotlin externalization. That's what I care about, not some implementation details. And this got me thinking, what is a library in the context of our ecosystem, of course? Is one dependency one library? And it's true for Kotlin X HTML, the library only consists of a single dependency. But if you look at Kotlin externalization, which has seven dependencies, seven artifacts, it's not true. Well, perhaps one group ID equals one library. And you can find examples where it is true. Everything under the uh, IO insert coin group ID belongs to coin. But then you look at uh, Oracle JetBrains Kotlin X, which has 10 different libraries under the same group ID. So that also doesn't work. Well, maybe one Git repository equals one library. And it would help with Kotlin X libraries, uh, because Kotlin X Daytime and Kotlin X realization have 
different repositories, but there are colon JS wrappers for different popular JavaScript libraries, and they live in the same monorepo. So monorepo kind of ruined it for us. And what about frameworks and toolkits and things that are bigger than libraries? Are they they're more like a collection of libraries, you may argue. Um, for example, should Kator have a single page, or should Kator client and Kator server have different pages? And if, if I've confused you, that's good. That's exactly how I felt. It's like, yeah, what the hell did I get myself into? I just wanted to build the website and not think about all of these you know, definitions. And that's perhaps the second takeaway from this talk. It, it does seem like our ecosystem lacks common enforceable definitions. And by our ecosystem, I mean Maven dependencies. So we are kind of in the same boat as, as Java. What is a library, a package, a dependency, an artifact, a framework? And how can you tell them apart? If you think you know the answer to, to those questions, think again. They are really full of corner cases and yeah, trade-offs. Um, the more you think about it, the more of them you find. And unfortunately, there's not much we can do about it at the moment. But what the hell, I still want my website, I thought. So let's try to finish it. The problem that we currently have is we have seven dependencies for Kotlin initialization, and they have seven, uh, seven pages, but we, we want one single page. The only way that I found to associate these seven artifacts together in a reli reliable way was by the GitHub link in their POM file. Um, literally couldn't find any other way. So this is the definition that I not ended up with. One GitHub repository equals one project, and notice the use of the word project. Um, I decided to avoid using words like library for reasons discussed earlier, whereas project, on the other hand, can be pretty much anything. So we will not offend anyone. We will not yeah, mislead anyone either. GitHub has user-friendly REST API with documentation. I won't go into details of, of using it, but we will be using it um, to build a page next. So again, starting from, from, from scratch, because the requirements changed just before the release, um, we have to build it again. Looking at the repository, we can extract the name, the various stats, like how many stars, when it was created, how many open issues it has. It might help with understanding how popular the library is or if it is abandoned. Then we can add some links, like the link to GitHub pages, if they're hosted. The license, of course, very important. And this time, it is an enum, so good job, GitHub. Apache license 2.0 will look exactly the same across the projects. But now for the most important part, we take the readme markdown file, we turn it into HTML, and whoosh, we got ourselves a readme. And the page already looks better. But something's missing. Do you remember how we had that description, short description for each library here? I think we need it here, too. At first, I thought I would take the description from GitHub, but it turns out GitHub repository descriptions are too small and non-informative, and sometimes even missing. Whereas we actually need more text, something that we can later use for full text search. However, the README, it is long, and it has a lot of interesting information. If only someone could like read all of it and summarize it. Right? And for a few cents, we have ourselves a description. Cool. Then we add the dependencies that belong to this project. That is, all dependencies that have links to this GitHub repository in their POM file. And we can extract the latest version, because they're the same. We can do the same for platforms, because again, the platforms are the same. And this is what we end up with. Honestly, it looks even better than before, um, especially with the README, very colorful. Cool. That's it. Again, that was easy. If that's what you thought, have you learned nothing? That's the third takeaway. This thing is not easy. First, this whole approach relies on dependencies, on dependencies telling us which GitHub repository they belong to. Well, who says it's correct? We cannot verify this. There's no way, way to verify this. You can think of one. It's not difficult, but it doesn't exist as of now. So it's just trust me, bro. Second, who says that the versions of the linked dependencies are going to be the same? Even if they have a common prefix, the version might still be very different, again, because of the monorepo. Then which version do we use here? We can take the version from the latest GitHub release, but not everybody uses GitHub releases, and it's still not going to be the same version as the version of the dependency. Right? So either way, it's misleading. Same for the platforms. Who says that all packages are going to have the same platforms? Some might be JVM only or native only. Then what do we display here? Is it fair to say the project as a whole supports all of them? Or do you take the, only the common platforms 
uh, in which case it would only be one common platform and it wouldn't be very useful. What's worse, not all of the linked dependencies can be up to date. Look at the release dates. Some were published two months ago, six months ago, 10 months ago, three years ago. Right? Some might have been published by mistake, but you cannot remove anything from Maven Central, so yeah, it's, it's there forever. And look at the names of the dependencies. Kator client tests, this looks like something internal, and it is. It's not actually meant to be published, but since each module gets published as a dependency, as an artifact to Maven Central, but not every module is a usable library with public API, you know, th there's nothing you can do about it. It just gets in the way. It's not even supposed to be shown here. I, as a user, don't care about it. Well, maybe we can look at the descriptions of the dependencies determine, to determine which ones are useful. You think that, and then you find out that most dependencies have copy-pasted descriptions, so 164 artifacts of Kator have the same exact text. Um, if you're a library author and you're laughing about it now, go check your own dependencies, because I tell you, this is like a global systematic problem um, that you don't notice when you look at artifacts individually, but once you have all of them in one place, that's when you notice it. And I cannot, again, I cannot blame library authors. If nobody reads these descriptions, why would you bother filling them out? And I could go on and on and on and on. There are so many coordinate cases, and again, once you have all the data at hand and you start tinkering with it, that's when you find them all. You know the saying, death by a thousand cuts? This is death by a thousand coordinate cases. But if you turn a blind eye and you kind of ignore these imperfections, you can still end up with a cool-looking website, which is also informative. This is what Calebs.io, the website we just built, looks now. Um, check it out after the talk if you haven't already. It's no longer a pet project of mine. It's built by people at JetBrains that actually know how to do front-end. So it was a major UI overhaul. Um, but yeah, we just built the MVP of PubDev for Kotlin. What have we learned? First of all, we learned that an index is not a repository. See, Calebs.io is an index. It relies on the information published to Maven Central. So it, it scans it, it indexes it, and it presents it in some nice way. But if the information in Maven Central is bad, Calebs.io cannot do anything about it. You put crap in, you get crap out, right? We have no control. Whereas PubDev on all of the other websites that we looked at in the beginning, they are package repositories. So not only is it a nice website to look at dependencies, but this is also a way where you publish the dependencies too. Right? So they can make up the rules, they can enforce the rules, and it makes the, the whole website much more useful and informative. Second is our ecosystem has a long way to go, but, but no one to guide it. I mean, who looks after Maven Central? It's Sonatype, but will Sonatype go to great lengths to fix all of these issues and start making rules and start enforcing them? That's a lot of work. Um, not even mentioning the, the website part. Um, and if, if it's not Maven Central that fixes it, then, then who? If, you, if, if I cannot do it as a pet project, no one will publish to my repository. Even if they do, I'll probably yeah, go bankrupt just from, the, uh, from all the costs associated with it. So it, it has to be backed up with, by some large company. But you can help. We don't actually need to build anything new, and it's not necessary that Maven Central fixes it. Um, we can improve the quality of the information in Maven Central. Um, if you're a library author, after today, go and fix the palms of your libraries. Right? Make it as informative as, as you can. Make sure each dependency has a unique description and uh, fill out all of the fields that you see. I don't know, give a link to your bug tracker, documentation, CI builds, whatever else. And even if those links aren't visible anywhere, aren't used by anyone, this information will make you stand out because someone might start indexing, indexing them at some point. And LLMs might already be indexing them now. So if your library has a unique description and various links, it might get recommended more, or the quality of answers related to your library might get, might get better. If you are a library user, go bully library authors to improve their POM files. And if, if they don't, submit pull requests. It's not difficult. Uh, just set the data yourself. Even if it's, if it's wrong, they'll the library authors will fix it. And in the long run, it will make it easier to find the libraries that you need. But most importantly, have fun building projects like this. It's not as difficult as it may seem, as we've just proven. And you can build these projects with Juni, the coding agent by JetBrains. Um, but yeah, anyway, thank you all. Use Caleb's I.O. and thank you.